Hello, I am Liana and I am a PhD student studying cancer biology at the Department of Biochemistry here in Cambridge. I am also a member of Gonville and Hughes College. In this taster talk, I am going to tell you about what they don't teach you about mitochondria A-level. In the first part of the talk, I will introduce you to some of the weird and wonderful things about mitochondria. And then I will go on to talk about the significance of mitochondria in cancer. One thing I know I was taught at A-level was aerobic respiration. In simple terms, aerobic respiration allows oxygen breathing creatures such as ourselves to turn fuel such as fats and sugars into energy. Mitochondria carry out aerobic respiration and are responsible for the production of ATP, the energy carrying molecule found in all cells. And this is why mitochondria are often referred to as the powerhouses of the cell. The left image is a transmission electron micrograph of a mitochondrion. And an individual mitochondrion has a diameter of about 0.5 to one micrometers. Mitochondria are surrounded by a double membrane, while the outer membrane controls trafficking of proteins, ions and small molecules into the mitochondria. The inner membrane is formed of folded cristae, and the purpose of this folding is to maximise the surface area for biochemical reactions to take place. So the mitochondria are certainly built like a factory. However, mitochondria perform many roles beyond energy production. These include redox homeostasis. Mitochondria are equipped with antioxidants that prevent or slow down intracellular damage caused by unstable molecules. This makes mitochondria particularly important components of aging. Mitochondria are also involved in the synthesis of fatty acids and steroid hormones such as estrogen. In response to death stimuli and chronic stress, Mitochondria can also initiate controlled cellular death or cell suicide. And mitochondria are able to influence cellular signaling pathways, leading to changes in cell behavior. But before we dive into this any further, I want to take you back to the origins of mitochondria. Symbiosis. Symbiosis is the interaction between two different organisms, typically to the advantage of both. The example I have here on the right is an oxpecker, a bird that rests on animals such as rhinos and zebras and feeds on any parasites. So the birds get fed and the animals get regular pest control. This is a mutually beneficial relationship. The reason I am telling you this is because it is hypothesized that about 4 billion years ago, a primary endosymbiosis event occurred when an ancestral cell engulfed an oxygen breathing bacteria. This partnership was mutually beneficial and conferred a survival advantage in the environment, which led to the evolution of an extraordinary chimeric organism known as the eukaryotic cell. And this was the beginning of complex life. The word mitochondrion comes from the Greek words mito, meaning thread, and chondrion, meaning grain-like. But what is the evidence that our mitochondria evolved from bacteria? The first thing is membranes. So as I showed you in the previous slide, mitochondria have their own membranes, just like bacteria do. The second thing is DNA. Each mitochondria has its own circular DNA genome that is not enclosed by a nucleus. This is exactly the same as a bacterial genome, but much, much smaller. And lastly, reproduction. Mitochondria multiply by growing and then pinching in half. This is the same process used by bacteria, also known as binary fission. Mitochondria also have the ability to fuse together to form a more interconnected mitochondrial network within the cell. When this theory of mitochondrial evolution first came to light, many scientists tried to grow mitochondria out of the cell and in a dish, and they were very unsuccessful. This is because over time, the mitochondrion has become codependent on the host cell. Simply put, the mitochondrial genome does not contain enough DNA for the mitochondrion to survive outside the host cell. So for mitochondria to produce mit more mitochondria, they are completely dependent on the host cell genome. Despite this, the mitochondria have retained mitochondrial DNA encoding 37 genes. And these genes are mainly important 
for energy production. So what can we learn from mitochondrial DNA? Mitochondrial DNA makes up a small percentage of your genome with the bulk of your DNA present in the nucleus. While nuclear DNA is inherited from both parents and undergoes recombination events during reproduction, which is the reason why you are different to your brothers and sisters, mitochondrial DNA, on the other hand, is inherently and solely inherited from your mother and can remain unchanged for tens of thousands of years. Your mitochondrial DNA is therefore a perfect copy of your mother's DNA and her mother's DNA and so on. As such, scientists have been able to use mitochondrial DNA to trace our genetic ancestry. The image on the left is from a research article from 1992. The phylogenic tree schematic shows the mitochondrial DNA, which is shown on the outer edge, points to a single female ancestor living in Africa. Scientists have therefore provided evidence that the most recent common female ancestor, who is known as mitochondrial Eve, lived in Southern Africa approximately 200,000 years ago. Although she was not the first woman to exist, all humans that exist to this day can trace their mitochondrial DNA back to her. So are mitochondrial genes important? Mitochondrial disease occurs when the mitochondria of the cell fail to produce enough energy for cell and organ function. This can be caused by mutations in both the mitochondrial genome and important mitochondrial genes encoded by the nuclear DNA. Symptoms can be mild, such as tiredness or weakness, or they can be severe and debilitating, such as poor growth, loss of movement, vision and hearing loss and organ failure. In the last few years, scientists have found a way to allow women harboring these mitochondrial DNA mutations to have healthy children. They do this by taking the nucleus and therefore the maternal DNA from the mother's egg and transplanting it into a donor egg with healthy mitochondria. Following which, this egg is fertilized with sperm from the father. So these children have DNA from free parents. And although the long-term effects of this are unknown, this technique is also now in clinical trials to overcome infertility. The main point of this slide, however, is to illustrate how important mitochondrial function is to human health and how dysfunctional mitochondria can have devastating consequences. So what about mitochondria and cancer? Well, decades ago, Otto Warburg observed that whereas normal cells produce ATP via aerobic respiration in the presence of oxygen, cancer cells ferment glucose and show a preference towards glycolysis. This is now known as the Warburg effect. Otto Warburg also suggested that defects in mitochondrial respiration may be the underlying cause of cancer. But are mitochondria actually dysfunctional in cancer? The answer, like many in science, is complicated. While new technologies and tools show some support for the Warburg effect, such as this magnetic resonance image or MRI, showing substantial uptake of carbon labeled glucose as shown in orange by the tumour, which is outlined in white, and the production of byproduct carbon labelled lactate, which suggests that this tumour is primarily glycolytic. There is also evidence, however, that many cancer cells require mitochondria to be functional, which reflects that other mitochondrial roles outside of metabolism may also be crucial in cancer development. Another complexity is due to intratumor metabolic plasticity, which in other words means that within a tumor, individual cancer cells can rely on different metabolic pathways as shown by the different colors in the image on the right. Therefore, if you target one pathway with a drug, you may kill the pink and blue cancer cells, but the others will live on and therefore so will the cancer. Despite cancer metabolism being highly heterogeneous, and influenced by multiple factors, altered metabolism does offer a therapeutic opportunity to target cancer cells. And there are many scientists here in Cambridge that are looking for ways to target mitochondria and metabolism in cancer and other diseases. So I'm going to finish off by introducing you to a relatively new concept in cell biology, which is the idea that organelles such as the mitochondrion nucleus communicate and this communication can lead to cell adaptations and promote the survival 
and predisposed cancer. This communication can occur via intracellular molecules such as reactive oxygen species and calcium ions or by physical interaction. So when mitochondria become dysfunctional, it is likely that these signals will change and this can lead to cellular transformation via mechanisms such as genome instability, altered metabolism and changed cell shape and behaviour. The image in the top right is a high resolution fluorescence image of some cells. The yellow is the nucleus, the pink is the cytoskeleton and the green is the mitochondria. And by imaging alongside other, other techniques, we are able to study these organelle interactions. As Keyes alumni Stephen Hawking said, try to make sense of what you see and wonder what makes the universe exist. Be curious. So I will finish off by leaving you with some questions to think about. One, thinking about the endosymbiosis theory, is it likely that complex life exists elsewhere in the universe? Two, how can we selectively target mitochondria for the treatment of age-related disease such as cancer? Three, is cancer a result of mitochondrial adaptation to stress over a lifetime? If you would like to know more, um, about what I've discussed today. Here are some further reading suggestions. Um, I strongly recommend Professor Nick Lane's book, Power, Sex and Suicide, um, Mitochondria and the Meaning of Life. I hope you have enjoyed this talk and you have found a newfound enthusiasm for mitochondria. Thanks so much for listening.